Good morning, good morning, Rabbi Otay. Welcome to Breakfast in the Class. Breakfast in the Class today is dedicated in loving memory of Angela Shoyet. Aleha Shalom Lulu Shabbat on Jelbat Lulu. On a 12-month Shana, sponsored by her son, Haron Shochet. Hazak Baruch, we also want to wish uh, Haron and Sandy Shochet the most incredible Mabruk and Mazal Tov on the dual news this past week of uh, two grandsons, Ishtabach Shemo, very special uh, Simcha, uh, one Brit Mila on Wednesday and one on Friday. The Simcha train should never end for the Shochet family, and uh, it should be Zocher Bezat Hashem, uh, to find Nechama in the new generation, our rabbis tell us, "Vizarach Hashemesh, Uba Hashemesh." The sun, the sun will set, and the sun will rise, and that when something, a tragedy happens, Hakadosh Baruch Hu gives you the beginnings of a new day. Uh, and Baruch Hashem, after having uh, two suns set this past year, we now have two suns uh, arising. Hamakom Yinachem Etchem Toch Shavuot Litzion, Yerushalayim. Happy Father's Day also, Liyemehem. Uh, uh, the week of Kobe was sponsored by David e. Ash in honor of you and your substantial capacity to go today and every day. My friends, this week's parasha is Parashat Shelach. The Parashat Shelach revolves around the story of the Jewish people in the, in the, uh, at the cusp of Eretz Israel, of entering the land of Israel, deciding that they're going to send spies in to Eretz Israel to check out the land. Now, that does not sound like such a terrible thing, kishle atzma. But actually, in the eyes of God, that was seen as a slap in the face. God said, I'm going to take you in. God said, I'm going to sort it out. And then what are you saying? I'm not sure, let me see. Imagine someone comes to you and says, you know, uh, for your 50th wedding anniversary, all the kids got together and we booked you a room in this hotel, a, night, a lovely trip for you and mom, etc., etc. Could you imagine the guy says, okay, uh, thank you so much. I'm going to go down now and I'm going to check it out and I'm going to see if I like the room. Who does that? Who speaks that way? Borei Olam was giving the gift of Eretz Israel to the Jewish people. For them to say, we want to check it out. We want to see what it's like. We want to see if we could conquer it. Hashem is saying, what do you mean conquer it? What you, you're not doing anything. I'm doing everything. And yet, the Jewish people insisted and God says, Shelach lecha. if you want to send, you send. I'm not telling you to send because I know that it's going to end in tragedy, as we know it does. The spies come back with a negative report. They speak ill of Lashon Hara. They speak Lashon Hara about Eretz Israel. The Jewish people are mourning and crying uh, in their tents, etc., etc. And Borei Olam, as punishment, the Jewish people pay for this insubordination, for this lack of gratitude of the 40 days that they spent touring the land. Yom Lishana, Yom Lishana. They pay for each day of the touring in Israel, they pay for with a year in the, in the Midbar, in the desert, until they finally arrive to Eretz Israel. Now there's a very interesting language uh, that applies, that is, that's, apl- that's applied, excuse me, to this situation, which takes a highly specific narrative in the Sefer by Midbar and makes it immediately relevant to each and every one of us. In the story itself, we are learning about the fact, I mean, what's the takeaway? Takeaway is, don't speak Lashon about Eretz, Lashon Arab at Eretz Israel when God promises you the land of Eretz Israel. I mean, how often is that relevant in your life? Like, you know, you know when you're entering into the land of Israel and God's promise, like, it's, you know, it's relevant a handful of times throughout history. How do we make something like that be a lesson which is eternal, which is uh, much more broad and wide-ranging? If you take a look, Rashi says something very interesting. He says the Miraglim were punished. You know why? Lama nismecha parasha zu. How come this parasha is connected to the parasha of Miriam? To tell you, these Rishayim saw what happened when Miriam spoke Lashon Ara about Moshe. And these Rishayim halalu ra'u velo lakechu musar. They saw and they did not learn their lesson. So, in other words, chronologically, the story of Miriam happens before the story of Miraglim. The Jewish people should have, the Jewish spies, should have learned the lesson of Lashon Hara, and they did not learn the lesson of Lashon Hara. Therefore, they're punished so terribly because they should have known, they should have known better. I, I want to share that I think that this line right here 
is really in some ways the way perhaps you and I can look at this story and learn and learn its lessons for our, for our lives. You know, the Chidushe Harim writes an amazing concept. He says that the Jewish people throughout all 40 years in the desert, right, they had a certain way of living and a certain interaction with God. But that way was not supposed to be for 40 years. Initially, it was supposed to be, as we said, for a matter of a month. They were supposed to build up towards uh, receiving the Torah and wander the desert a little bit until that point. And when they came as spies to that place, they were ready to go in. They were supposed to be in, in the desert for a short amount of time. Why did they have to be in the desert at all? And the rabbis explain, because Borei Olam was giving them a chance to be able to rewire their brains. And let me explain what this rewiring looks like. When a person is living in the desert and they realize that bread and food does not grow in the grocery store and it does not grow in the ground, you don't need to own a field in order to eat food. You don't need to have money in order to uh, eat food. What did you need in order to have the man? And in what way was your man superior to everybody else's? Based on, like we said last week, your connection to Borei Olam, your level of tefillah, your level of emuna, your level of being a sadiq, that's how close the man was to your door. The lessons that bread could fall from the heavens, and you don't need to do anything. The lessons that protection was based on the anana kavod, and that came from God. The lesson that the well travels with you. The lesson that Borei Olam hands minas shamayim, hands the Torah down to his people in this world. All of those lessons were lessons designed to teach the Jewish people that the nature that they were witnessing around them was really a mask being, uh, sorry, sorry, hiding Borei Olam's interaction with this world. If a person could look at nature and not see nature but see God, then they would have learned the lesson of the desert. They get to Eretz Yisrael's border and Borei Olam is hoping that they got to that stage. But what happened, says the Chidushe Harim, they went into Eretz Yisrael and they saw giants. And what did they think when they saw giants? They thought these are people that we can't beat. If they were able to see nature as an extension of God's arm, so if God said they're going in, who cares how tall the guy is? Why is that relevant? Let me explain. I'll give you an example. Sammy, how tall are you? Five, eight and a half. Five, eight and a half, Sammy Sutton. Okay? And guys, if you want to send in, women, if you want to send in your resume, uh, he's five, eight, five, eight and a half, but he's, uh, he's dynamite. Okay? Anyway, so Sammy at five, eight and a half loves playing basketball. He has a good outside shot. If Sammy is driving to the hoop, he wants to take a layup, he wants to go inside. You know, if he sees, looks up and he sees in the paint this flipping minute bowl. Sam, could you tell, who's minute bowl? Seven foot six, made for the whistle. Seven foot six guy, giant. They found him in Africa, sitting around the campfire, by the way. They found him in Africa. He was 80, 90 pounds, seven foot nine, a toothpick. All right? An NBA agent takes him, brings him back, says, Have I got the sport for you? Okay? Brings him back. They gave him a ball. They told him to dunk. Minute Bowl ran up to the basket, went up to dunk, broke his teeth on the rim. Okay? No clue. But eventually, you're that tall. You have a wingspan like that. He's blocking shots left, right, and center. Sammy, if Sammy sees Minute Bowl, what does he think? Forget it. I can't drive on this guy underneath. Five and eight, five, eight and a half to seven, nine, seven, uh, six. That's, he's got two feet on him, right? There's no way. Then he's got the wingspan of a seven foot and six guy, okay? So together, he's got four feet on, on, on you, right? Impossible to shoot on the guy. Can I ask you a question? So Manute Bull is not a guy you want to drive on, under the hoop. If you're shooting three and Manute Bull is underneath, is he relevant how tall he is? No. If he tries to block your shot, what is that called? Goaltending. We get the points anyway. So if I'm shooting a three-point shot, I don't care how tall Manute Bull is. Let me give you a better example. Better example. Imagine you're flying to Israel and you're checking your suitcase in and you look behind the check-in counter at the airport and who's checking in your bags? Manupo. Are you going to be afraid to check in your bags because he's seven foot six? It was not relevant. I'm not trying to throw the suitcase over his head. Right? So it was not relevant. His height is completely, it completely, has nothing to do with the situation at hand. So they come in and they see these giants. Wow, they're so tall. Who cares? Are you fighting them? 
You were in the desert. You were in, uh, in Egypt, right? You saw how when God wanted the firstborn to die, what happened? 12 o'clock on the button, every firstborn in Egypt drops dead. Did the Jews need to stab them? Did they need to kill them? Did they need to chop them in half? Did they need to fight with them? They didn't need to do anything. So of what relevance is their height? Wow, they're so tall. Irrelevant. Now, if you see it that way, you suddenly start to realize that the failure of the spies and the Jewish people at the border of the land of Israel was such that it took all of the lessons they learned in the desert and rendered them unlearned. Now, I don't know if you know how it works in school, but if you take the tests, uh, you know, uh, and you don't pass any of the tests, what do they do? You have a failing grade in second grade, in seventh grade. What happens? You don't graduate to the next class. They leave you back a year. Why? Because you didn't learn the material. The Jews proved with their fear that they had not learned the material. They had not learned the lessons of Bamidbar. The spies proved with their Lashon Hara that they had not learned the lesson of Miriam. Rashishaim halalu. These wicked men, they looked, they saw, and they did not learn the proper way to act. My friends, life's like that. You get given a chance to learn lessons. And then comes the time to implement those lessons. And what happens when you show Borei Olam that you haven't learned your lesson from the challenges you had? You haven't learned your lesson from the difficulties. You haven't learned your lesson from the things you saw. The Miraglim didn't speak Lashon Hara about Moshe Rabbeinu. But they saw someone who did. And they saw them getting punished. They should have saw, seen and learned their lesson. And they didn't. What happens in that situation? You need to learn it again. You held back a year. Many times, a person feels in their life that something is stuck and they cannot move forward. That's what's happening. You're not graduating. And you're not graduating because you haven't learned the lesson. What am I not seeing? What did I not learn? That therefore Borei Olam needs to keep me in what seems like an interminable loop. Is that not powerful? That's what we're learning here, according to the Chidu Sharim. That's what we're learning here from the, uh, the Chazal that Rashi is quoting. They didn't learn their lesson. But to me, the lesson of the Miraglim is an even more powerful concept than the lesson that Am Yisrael should have learned. You see, in the Chazal and in the Chidush of the Chidu Sharim, there's two different ideas. One idea is with regard to the Jewish people that they didn't learn a lesson from their own life. The lesson of the Miraglim is perhaps a little scarier. They didn't learn the lesson of someone else's mistake. They're being punished not just because they didn't learn life's messages and life's lessons with regard to themselves. I remember my rabbi used to quote that when something happened, used to quote the Chazal that says that when something happens to Echad mi Chabura, to one of the group, learning together in Bar Menan, someone in the group and all the students in the ra- in the Kolel or in the Yeshiva, something happens. The Pasuk says, Ki ala mavet When death is in the window, there's a reckoning, there's an opportunity for everyone to reflect. And the ones that are supposed to reflect are not only the ones that that happened to. It's also the ones that that happened near. Otherwise, we run the risk of Borei Olam looking at us and saying, Rishaim halalu ra'u velo lakhu musar. These wicked ones, they saw and they didn't learn. They didn't learn the proper lesson. Now, I'd like to ask a simple question. And that is, okay, Rabbi, you got me. 
But how do I actually put this into practice? How do I become attenuated to this idea that I have to learn God's messages? How much to do that? And, and I want to point something out which I thought was always, was always so interesting. I'll never forget, I was on a Pesach program once and a fellow with long hair with a, uh, what's it called? A super spiritual vibe. You know, he's wearing like a linen shirt, three quarter length sleeve. You know the type, right? His, his what's it called? His shorts are not to his knees. They're like in the calf level, you know, three quarter pants. And I thought to myself, I wonder if this guy, if his clothing and his hippie personality mirrored his clothing. That's the concept. This is a guy who never finishes anything. <laughs> he's got most of the sleeve, most of the pants. Most of the job, most of the relationship. Okay, either way, I wasn't sure. I don't know, I'm just being judgy, right? Okay. Anyway, the guy comes up to me. He was the most spiritual, so special, this guy. I was talking about a concept of trying to understand what Borei Olam was communicating to us. And he says, Rabbi, he comes, he goes, I need to ask you a question. Can I come back after the class and ask you a question? I said, sure. He goes, where should we meet? Meet in the lobby. I come to the lobby. Guy comes down. Long, beautiful hair. Right, his uh, island clothes, and now he's got a guitar with ev- just covered in stickers. I'm like, okay, what's this? And he goes, Rabbi, sit down. I sit down. And he says, I'm going to ask you a question in the form of a song. I was like, Shema Israel. <laughs> and he starts singing me a song. And I was struck by how wrong I was, how beautiful this was. In the song, he says, Dear God, I have only one question that I ask of you. And if you answer me this, I'll never ask you another. He says, when I come to a mountain in my life, are you telling me to turn around and go home? Or are you challenging me to climb to the other side? A person can see something that happens to them in their life and read HaKadosh Baruch Hu's message to them as saying to them, that challenge tells them, this is not for you. It's not meant to be. This thing tells you, Hashem is telling you, I don't want you to go. But the person could also look at that same challenge and say, it's not God telling me to go home. It's God telling me to get my boots and climb to the top of this thing. How does one know which is the answer? And he sings this whole song. It was, I have to say, it was a moving experience. You could see a person's neshama was grappling. He obviously wasn't asking it in a theoretical way or for a friend. He was asking about something that was going on, going through his life. Right? Great question. How do you know what the messages are saying? The miraglim are taken to task. Right? The Jews are being, they're being taken to task for not recognizing that what you see is not what you get. We should have learned that. We should have realized. You know, in the, in the moment, you think to yourself that there's got to be another way. Maybe this message is telling me to do something else with my life. Maybe this message with this girl, she doesn't want to go out anymore. The message is it's not meant to be. How do I know whether the message is leave her alone or the message is try harder to make this work? How do you know? (laughs) My friends, the answer is you don't. You don't know. If you were a Navi, if you had Ruach HaKodesh, maybe you would. So there was once a time, where even if you didn't have Ruach HaKodesh, there was someone else who did. And you could go to them. And sometimes a person, it's their responsibility to go to a rabbi, to a tzaddik, to ask them, this is the situation, I've tried to think it through, I've thought through all the angles, what am I supposed to do now? And sometimes a sadiq, a rabbi, can guide you when a person is lost. But there's times that unless the sadiq is a navi of God himself, he won't know. Pros and cons. Each side. What's a person supposed to do in those moments? So I said to this young man, who asked me this heartfelt question, I said, I'm sorry that I'm going to make this worse for you. So what do you mean? I said, you're forgetting a third option. You're stuck between two. Go home or climb the mountain. I said, but there's a third option. And the third option is stay here. 
at the bottom of the mountain with your questions, with your doubts. Now, let's try and categorize what this young man was saying. Is God asking you for fight? Move forward. Is God asking you for flight? Go run back home. Okay? But there's a third approach that a human being has when we're faced with a dilemma. We can either run away, right? We can either fight and move forward, but there's a third option, and that is fright. When a person out of fear from that moment, they freeze and they can't react. So they're stuck in that moment. They can't run forward, they can't move away, they freeze. Those are the three responses that people have to trauma, to fear, to uncertainty, right? That's how it works. I said, you forgot the third option. Let's think about this for a minute. HaKadosh Baruch Hu promises us that Mashiach is coming. And what do we say about the arrival of Mashiach? I believe with complete faith that Mashiach is coming, right? He's coming imminently, right? And even though, even though it takes him a long time, I'll wait for him. Every day, I'll wait for him to come. Wait for him to come. Wait for him to come. Wait for him to wait for him to come. Living with the doubt of when Mashiach is going to come. That was God's plan. He doesn't want you to know when. He doesn't want you to know when. And He wants to see how do you live with the uncertainty? How do you act with the uncertainty? What does your faith look like at the bottom of the mountain? Not going home and moving on. Not climbing to the other side like we find at the end of this week's parasha. They made a mistake thinking that that's what God wanted from them. But to just stay here. And to live with confused uh, faith. Not that their faith is confused, but that their path is confused. To understand that sometimes I don't have to have all the answers. It's a wild concept. So he says to me, now you've introduced a third option. Leave, break up with this person, go forward even though you're not sure, or just kind of carry on in this holding pattern until something, now I have a third option, I don't even know. What should I do? You killed me, Rabbi. I said to him, when there is no answer, when a person doesn't have a Sadiq, a Navi to be able to, what are they supposed to do? Now I want to share with you something that I think is very powerful. You know, I'm fond of repeating over a famous idea from Rav Shach. Rav Shach says that in the time of the Churban, the, the destruction of the temple, the Jewish people went to the Chachamim, to the Nevi'im, and they said, why is the temple being destroyed? And the Chachamim could not say, and the Nevi'im did not know, until they went to Borei Olam, until Hashem himself had to say, say you know why I'm destroying the temple? al ozvam et Torati. Because they abandoned my Torah. And the Gemara says, that means, they did not make a blessing on the Torah first. What the interpretation of that is, is for another day. But Rav Shach asks an amazing question. He says, they asked the rabbis, they asked the Nevi'im, they didn't know. How could God punish them then? If the righteous men and the wise men and the sages and the, and the prophets, if they didn't know what they did, how could you blame the guys, the Jewish person, the average man and woman and child in Am Yisrael? How could you blame them if their leaders didn't know? If the scholars didn't know? How could you blame the Jews? And Rav Shach says something so piercing. He said the Nevi'im did not know, and the Tzadikim did not know, and the Chachamim did not know. But the people, but each and every person, they knew. You see, the wisdom or the prophet, uh, that's coming from an external source. It's trying to figure out what the message of God is. But a person knows his own deficiencies. A person knows his own tendencies. So when a person is stuck and they're trying to figure out what God wants of them, you're not just reading the signs of nature. You're seeing the uh, impediment or the challenge placed in front of you. 
And then you look at yourself and say, what am I supposed to be doing here? If I was a better person, what would I do? If there is no answer to that, if there's nothing you could do to be better, if you're pushing yourself to the max that you can in your own universe, then clearly the message here is not for you to try harder. You can't. Until you've exhausted that possibility, it is not upon us to say that God's mountain is designed to tell us to turn back. The default message is climb forward. When there's a reason why that thing would be bad for me in the eyes of Bore Olam, would make me into a worse person, then I can learn that the impediment is there for me. So see the mountain through the eyes of God and then ask yourself, not what is God telling me without responsibilities, but with full responsibilities. What could this mountain be saying to me? Suddenly, the answer becomes much clearer. And when it is exactly 50-50 in your mind of moving forward or going back, then you know that Bore Olam wants you to work on it here in the land of uncertainty. Sometimes God wants you to leave your job. And sometimes God wants you to get a new job. But sometimes God wants you right here where you are. Show me your faith when things are not moving forward. If you understand it this way, you have learned the lesson of the Miraglim. You're learning the lesson of the Chidushi Harim of the Jewish people having learned that nature is but a mask and that everything that you see should be translated and fed through the Emunah loop. And if you look at the world that way, my friends, you are looking at a radically different world than everybody else.